You know, thank you. That was, that was really a great uh, tour and overview. So I guess we're going to figure out how to have 15 or minutes or so conversation. Do you want to sit down? Yes. We can take every other chair and leave space for uh, whatever else. Uh, how about that? Yeah. OK. Where, yeah. So I have, I have one question, and then maybe we'll just have a dis, you know, maybe we'll have an open discussion with whoever wants to uh, put something forward. You know, I think we've seen a really tremendous uh, summary here of, of uh, success around things like vision, voice recognition, playing games, doing translation, uh, the applications of medicine are evident and compelling. Uh, mathematical discovery on its way, uh, conversation, art to some degree, to reasonable degree, uh, and so on. I have one question about a limitation. Uh, many of these things remind me, you know, of one geeky person in the corner of the office who's the smart person you go ask some, some puzzle question, uh, but maybe isn't the person who you most want to have uh, a beer with after work. Uh, so I'm, I'm reminded, I don't want to, I didn't want to put that negative spin on the example I'm going to give, but uh, I worked uh, for a significant part of the 1980s at Bell Laboratories, and across the hall from me was a person named Shoji, and Shoji did not have a desk that he sat at like everyone else, he didn't have a workstation. What he had was a big uh, stand where people would put uh, the outlines of their circuit uh, before it was manufactured. And they would bring them to him and he would stare at them for three or four days. And then he would say, if you make this wire a little bit wider and you make this other one a little bit narrower and you reduce the clock speed by a very small amount, this will work. And then they would go away happy. So I think we can automate someone like that who you consult with your hard problem. But he didn't really interact with the rest of us. I never saw him at lunch. I mean, so where are we in terms of putting something in uh, a complex organization that can interact with other people and be a contributor in another sense besides that? So first of all, you may disagree horribly with my characterization of where we are. I'd be interested in your view on that. And then on this other question, where are we in terms of interaction with others in a meaningful way? Yeah, so, so let me say, you know, I think it's actually a reasonable, a very good, yeah, so it's actually a very good uh, example. I think we, the task that we're good at nowadays are indeed somewhat individual and, and don't involve uh, human interactions. Um, it is an area where, where, where AI researchers are also exploring, where uh, in healthcare applications, elderly care, where you have robots that assist us, the field of assistive robotics, and there, indeed, the interaction with the, the human is, is very important uh, and some level of social skills. Uh, I'm not, my, my hesitation about that work is what, what, what people have discovered is that humans are easily fooled. So um, they, you know, when they put them actually in elderly homes and, and people actually get attached to the robots and, uh, you know, give them human type properties just like they would uh, to a pet. Um, but in some sense, the humans are actually being fooled about the real, um, the kind of interactions they have. So it's, it's actually an area where I think there's some concern about what is proposed as solutions, but, but it is a challenge for AI, um, and, and the current approaches are not quite doing it. Of course, I had to spend both of your talks in order to come up with one example that seemed hard. So Jeff, what do you think? Uh, I think that the situation you described will probably want to be one of the last things to go. Uh, you're almost talking about something that's Turing complete that you want to interact with and hang out understands everything you do. I think we've all come to realize that it's no fun talking to people uh, that don't really understand what you're saying and where communication is frustrating. And so, um, I, as Bart said, common sense, a deep understanding of language, uh, holding a conversation, et cetera, et cetera. These are very hard problems. People are working on them, but they will probably resist uh, the efforts of researchers for a few years. Nobody knows how long it'll take. So that'll probably be one of the last things, but there's a lot between there and, you know, here and there that will cause massive disruptions in the workplace. What's the current thought about the future of programmers and computer engineers? Sure. 
Um, so Andre Carpathy, who is a friend of mine, uh, who is currently the lead scientist or, uh, at Tesla, or one of them, uh, he talks about software 2.0, where software 1.0 is you wrote a program and did exactly what you want and you knew exactly what it was doing. Software 2.0 is more like being kind of like a lion trainer or a dog trainer. You set the conditions of, wh of when you, uh, you know, of, of for learning, for AI to learn. You kind of give it some inputs, you give it some reward single signals, and you kind of learn how to shape its learning and its training. And then it all kind of figures out the rest, and you hope that it does, it's going to do what you want in most situations, but you're never fully sure. And so I think that um, this is the future for a lot of software and, and programming, is that you basically, you will have people that are very good at AI training and they learn the tricks and the tools to get AI to do what they want, but you are not specifying each line of the program. Uh, of course, there will be some people that are working on lower level pieces of the stack, but increasingly, I think that's how people will um, interact with computers. I also think the future of computing as it becomes better and better looks a lot like the Star Trek computer. So currently, this is called you know, conversational agents or voice agents, but ultimately, what Google is trying to build and Facebook is trying to build and even P we at Uber are trying to build are computers that can understand your request and, and uh, take your orders. So as a scientist, I would love to be able to say, you know, can you please you know, plot the you know, carbon over the last three decades? No, put it on a log scale. Now just like, figure out the principal components that go into that and show them to me and interact with the computer in a very natural way and have it do what I want. And that takes a task that would take maybe me hours or days to do down to seconds. And everybody can think of situations where you wish you could just tell your computer what you want and it did it for you. So ultimately, that's where we're going and programmers will be the same. They will kind of specify things maybe in these natural language interfaces and that's how you'll program your computer. Uh, Jeff, I was kind of interested in your last slide about what the future could hold and how everything could potentially be done this way. Um, there's an issue that almost all the institutions in this room grapple with and that is finding and sorting student talent, meaning admissions. Can you imagine, and maybe both or one of you could address this, could you imagine AI being the admissions dean of the future, especially given the headlines of the last two days about what's happening at Harvard and the University of Chicago, because we're trying to soar through you know, tens of thousands, and we could imagine in the future, especially in a much more interconnected world, but we're also waiting for these applications to come in. Can we also imagine AI helping us find talent around the world? I'll answer that since this was addressed to me, and then I'll turn it over to Bart. Um, ironically enough, my postdoc advisor at Cornell, Hod Lipson, uh, he tried this with uh, admissions data, and I also spoke to a uh, current dean at the University of Maryland who has also tried this. Um, and certainly there is an opportunity for AI to look at incoming application packets and try to detect patterns, which are what are the signals of people that will be successful and that will be uh, less successful and to help with that. But I want to tell you a very cautionary tale which worries me a lot. And that is that AI can uh, be very helpful, but it can also be very biased in ways that we don't anticipate and understand. So uh, imagine if you were a Fortune 500 company or a university, uh, I'll just stick with the company example, and you have, say, 100 years of employment data. You see the incoming application and everything you knew about them before you hired them, and then you see their entire career trajectory, and you say, I want to know who I should have hired and who I shouldn't have hired. So I will take a machine learning system and I will train it to predict from that initial application who did well and who didn't. Well, I have to come up with a measure of who did well for my system, and I say, well, naturally, I, I want to know who got promoted a lot and who got raised a lot. So you train up this system, and what will it do? It will tell you to hire white men. Because sadly, over the last few decades, we have given more promotions and more raises to white men than other very, very well-deserving people. And so the AI will detect patterns in your data, but not, and therefore it will do what you asked it to do, which is predict promotions and raises, but not what you wanted it to do, which is find the talented people in your application pool. So you have to be careful when wielding this technology. Yeah, so that, that's, I guess, I, I actually would would like to reiterate that point that is the bias that's hidden in these systems uh, can be substantial even if you your objectives you give them sound very good uh, uh, you may actually want people that are different than that you have currently and the AI system will not you, you would have to give it explicit uh, instructions to do so so um I think the question that comes up a lot for people that work in business is um, they want to utilize AI in some way 
um, especially businesses that aren't Fortune 500 companies that you know can afford, first of all, the equipment as well as you know the developers and programmers that do all the AI. Um, what type of kind of entry level um, AI stuff can can companies utilize today that isn't a tremendous expense and uh, to kind of get things kicked off in that and start utilizing it? I think what we're seeing is, is a lot of these tools uh, are, are available actually as shared code, like, like TensorFlow or, or like deep learning systems. So I see our students, which are uh, you know students coming out of Cornell, computer science trained, have done some AI course, some deep learning course. Um, they go to, to smaller companies and actually can be quite productive uh, in, in getting um, AI systems going. They use the shared uh, software. Uh, then the company defines often a very specific task that the company is really focusing on. And their challenge is within that company to get enough data. Uh, but basically, it, it's, it, it doesn't, I think small companies are, can be successful uh, at, at the game um, because they have their own specialization and I'm, I'm, the students tell me about you know the kind of things the companies do and the, these are things I'd never thought of but the company has specialized in it. it's a small company often um, and then the students can be quite productive so you, you just have to hire a, a few computer science uh, students a bachelor level uh, and luckily the tools are being shared it, it would be a much bigger problem if these tools were not shared but but right now they're shared software uh, to, just to quickly add to that, I agree that the tools are available and increasingly companies are trying to make automated tools like Google's trying to make auto ML tools and so are a lot of other companies. But I also just want to share that uh, what I would look for if I was a small company is I would look for a passionate individual that wants to learn. It's going to be very hard to hire somebody who already knows these skills because everyone in the world is trying to hire them and they're very, very expensive. But if you find somebody who's mathematically gifted or uh, has uh, is a good programmer and they just want to learn, maybe you hire them and you give them the opportunity because another thing that's also available out there are all the educational materials to learn these skills. There are online courses. There's basically the sky's the limit. You can learn as much as you want as long as an employer gave you a full-time job of say, hey, spend six weeks, get good at deep learning, and then apply it to this problem we have. If you had the right person that's passionate and smart and technically sophisticated and has a little bit of math background, they will do wonderful things after six weeks of online learning. So give them the space to do that, and you might find the person already within your ranks, or you can hire somebody that wants to take on that sort of challenge, because there are so many people that want to get into this field that if you give them the opportunity to self-train in that direction, get their first project with you, and then maybe go off and get another job, or you give them increasing responsibilities to do AI within your company, I think great things will happen. Hi. Um, Excellent uh, summary of where we're going. One of the things that I really like about Andrew's analogy between AI and electricity is it brings to mind the Industrial Revolution. And one of the things I want to understand is how, what will the next Luddite response be? In other words, you know, we, we had a negative response to the first Industrial Revolution. We sort of had to get through that to improve everybody's lives. We're likely to see something like that in response to AI. We can already see a lot of data that says that, you know, people are really nervous. So my question is, exactly. The question is, is what will the response look like? I think it's a threat. And is there something we can do to educate people, not just in college, but K through 12, to live with AI and make this transition uh, a good one? So I think it's a very good question. I, I think different countries will actually deal quite differently with this. So I actually think that the U.S. has a much bigger challenge uh, in because some people will lose. I mean, it's, it's not you can say, oh, the next generation, you know, train for the right jobs, although we don't even quite know what they are. Uh, currently, you know, people in, in, in lots of different professions, like the first big, big uh, difficulties you will probably see in the area of, of self-driving cars and, and commercial driving. Uh, these jobs will disappear, but in a lot of uh, other retail jobs, there are all kinds of jobs that, that, that are under threat. 
And society will have to come up with a response, and that will require a political uh, decisions. Um, now, when you go to China, for example, and you ask people there how worried they are, they are less worried about uh, the job situation because they say the government's uh, task is to take care of us. So they're, they're counting on the government will do something for them, uh, which is an interesting perspective. I had not expected that. Um, but they are less worried about AI. So, yeah, they got orders, yeah. Whatever it is, they're not as worried as Americans uh, are because it's not clear what the government will do for the American worker. Yeah. All right. So uh, my question is, when we sort of imagine the future, and we talk, we're often talking about sort of us and them, AI and human, but there's a, um, another technology that's been evolving over the last couple decades, and that's the brain-computer interface. Um, there's been a lot of investment in neuroengineering, and it's not that, you know, which is really, a lot of the work has just been, you know, input and outputs to the human nervous system, and so it's now not much of a leap to now connect uh, neural implants with um, AI sorts of things, and where do you see that? Do you see discussions of that now? And, and I think this kind of convergence yeah. is probably an area that makes it a little less predictable. Yeah, yeah. so now I'm actually quite excited about that the human computer you know, interaction, the, the collaborative aspect between AI systems and, uh, and humans. So I, I, in scientific discovery, so in my area that I'm quite excited about now is the whole area of scientific discovery, mathematical discovery. I don't see the machine as a threat. The machine will complement us. Uh, we'll actually, you know, for the mathematical discovery, for example, it will give the mathematician insights that the human can't have, the certain facts that the human can't see, but then the human brings a perspective that the machine doesn't have. So I, you know, I think it's, it's better to think of, of AI not so much as us versus them, uh, more about the opportunities that will come when we start collaborating with the machines, and the machines will do things for us that are beneficial to us, and, and will extend our own capabilities. And uh, the, the, the brain interfaces are, are one angle to, to, to exploit there. So AI is a very powerful tool, and as history has shown, any tool that you put into the hands of a human will eventually be used for evil. I'm interested in your thoughts to what extent we should and could protect AI from humans, so the opposite of the question that we're really asking here. <laughs> You mean? Pr right. pr is do, you, do, you, do you really want to take that one? No. I'll, I'll <laughs> take it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I think that there is a tremendous amount that we need to worry about in terms of the downsides and uh, the dark uses of AI. It's a very powerful tool, and as you pointed out, humans frequently use tools for both good and evil. And what we'd like to do is maximize the benefit and minimize the harm as with any new tool. Uh, AI is a particularly interesting one because it could ultimately usurp control from humans, and that makes it uh, different and dangerous in certain ways. So I think that one way to protect human humanity and protect AI from darker elements of humanity is to try to create AI that shares our values. And there is at least one world in which you create AI that shares our values, and the first AI is the last AI. That once you get the first one and it shares our values, it suppresses the creation of other AIs that don't share our values. And personally, I think that's our best chance. Good. So I think we're off to a good start. It's clear everybody has a question, and uh, we're going to have great discussion here, uh, much of which can occur productively over coffee breaks. So why don't we take a coffee break and come back here, and then we'll have more fun. Thank you. <laughs>